Jonathan? Our scripture reading is taken from Psalms 104, verse 33. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Good morning, brother. Good morning, sisters. If you can kneel or if you can't, uh, you can stand. So we are about to pray this morning. We're going to thank God for what he has done for us. We know that some of us, we go through a lot this week. But thank God you are here. Thank God. You have reason to praise him today. You have reason. If you don't have a reason, Look at yourself. Take a little time. Look at yourself. And look around you. There's a lot to thank God for. We're going to pray. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning. We give you praise. And we give you glory. Thank you for a wonderful day. Another day. Sabbath. You gave us to worship you. If I come here this morning, I meet my friend, I will be happy to meet them. But I don't come here to just meet my friend. I come to meet you, Father. Sometimes we misunderstand that. We come here and play around with friends, but we forget what we come for. We come to meet you this morning. You give us an appointment, we come. Please, bless us in a special way. Don't let us go back home the same way we came. Every day we come and go. Sometimes nothing changed. The same old men, the same old women. We can do the same thing we used to do 10, 20 years ago. Please, we ask you this morning to transform us. Hide us under your mighty wing. Give us the power that we need to change our ways. Not all the time our ways is your way. You have your own way, Father. You have your own way. You want us to be. Please, we need more of you. We need less of us and more of you. We pray for the rest of the service, the message, the listen, everything we are going to do. Don't let human beings act, but you by your Holy Spirit, take control of the service. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. We will now separate into a Sabbath school. We will have the adult in here by Elder DA and the teens in the choir room and the um, youths in the um, small fellowship hall and the other classrooms in the foyer. Thank you.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is good to be in the house of the Lord again. We say like the psalmist, it was good when they say, let us go to the house of the Lord, right? And man, it's good to be here. Uh, we thank God for a good week. The fact that we are here, you know, even though there might have been many challenges, you know, there might have been different situations to deal with, but by the grace of God, we're here in his temple. So we have a very good lesson today entitled Worship. Again, we're talking about, we're still on the Psalms, and uh, it's about worship that never ends. It is, it was good to, met, to, to do that study, depending on my eyes and different uh, ideas that I didn't really think about so much, and I hope it did the same for each one of you. So before we go into the lesson, let us say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again once more for all your mercies and your blessings and your goodness and all your wonderful deeds, Father God, in, in life and creation and toward each one of us individually. So at this moment, we invite your presence to help us, Lord, as we uh, discuss your word and meditate on your word and study together. We ask your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and our hearts, Father God, and help us to remember the information that we review together, God, so that we can apply them in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, worship that never ends. It's, uh, it's wonderful to think about worship in that sense, not in, not in a way, in a, not like a particular experience that, that happens at certain times only, but an unending life uh, style, you know, a lifestyle of Praising God, and which is something that happens not just at a moment. It's, a, it's an ongoing process, which is why we have the title, Worship That Never Ends. Again, the memory text is found in 100, uh, Psalm 104, verse 33. It says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Again, this really expresses the idea of worship that never ends. So we're going to be looking on, on Sabbath uh, lesson. It talks about uh, some elements of worship. First, we'd like to look at what worship really is to us. So we have to ask the question, so what is worship? And when we look at the, the idea of worship, we think about, you know, bowing down, to bow down, to prostrate oneself, and uh, before someone who's superior in homage, before God in worship, and it's about reverence, and to express praise and devotion. So this, this is the idea of, that we're talking about when we say worship. So it's not something for just anyone when we're talking about bowing down. So whenever we think about worship, even though we may not always be in a situation, environment where we can bow, but in our spirits, we can always bow and prostrate oneself in our mind and in our spirit as we meditate and think about who is it that we are talking to. You know, because we're talking about the creator, the redeemer, the all-powerful God. So therefore, we come when, wherever and whenever we are worshiping God, that we come in a position of prostrating ourselves and bowing ourselves before the living God. And we talk about also praising when we think about worship. And to praise is to worship, to tell of someone's goodness, to say something good about someone, to tell, to say, you know, what they have done for us. This is the idea that we think about when we talk about praise. And as I was doing the lesson, and many of us know that everyone like a word of praise, when you do something well or you do something good. It is good for us. So even more, the creator of heaven and earth likes to hear that you talk about his goodness and the things that he is doing, uh, that he's done for who he is. And uh, 
And the word of uh, worship in the Hebrew, is, I was, um, as I was doing the lesson, we find the word tela, which is praise, it's adoration, thanksgiving, uh, giving to God. And it's an act or general or public praise demanded by qualities or deeds or attributes of God. So when we think about praise and worship, we're talking about the, the deeds of God, the qualities that he has, who he is, his essence. And, and in essence, we're talking about God being the almighty, powerful creator as uh, some of the qualities being the creator and being the redeemer of us, right? And, uh, and his deeds. What about specific things that he's doing in our lives as we talk about the deeds of God? And then when we think about worship and praise, we think about those things. And, uh, and also his attributes. And uh, in essence, like, what are some attributes that we can think of, of who God is? Those are all elements that we need to think of as we think about worship and praise. And uh, it refers to lifting up God as we praise him. It is a joyful recounting of what God has done for us. Praise and thanksgiving go hand in hand as we thank God and, and offer appreciation for who he is. It's the acknowledgement of all of the all wonderful work of God, his righteous deeds, and, and because he is worthy to be praised. We find this in Psalm uh, 18, verse 3. And the first Chronicles 16, 28 to 30, it says, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. And Psalm 95, verse 6 says, Let us come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. So going a little bit more into worship, any ideas on that maybe we didn't touch on that you can think about of worship? Anybody has the mic? Oh, there you go. Thank you, Elder. Mine is more a question for us to think about, and maybe someone might want to answer that question. Um, earlier you said, you know, for us to think about the attributes of God mm -hmm. and our worship, and we know many of his attributes. He have created us in his image, and that's to reflect his attributes as well, that he's good, his goodness, his faithfulness, so when we think of those attributes, um, maybe it can lead us back to him so we can have a closer relationship and so we can reflect those attributes to our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, our co-workers. We can decide that we will walk in righteousness, faithfulness, we'll be um, good to our fellow brethren. It's just a thought. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your input. Well, as very great point, and as we move forward in the lesson, those are some of the points that we will see are some of the attributes of the true worshiper. Just as you mentioned the attributes of God of being good, being upright, uh, righteousness, and goodness, and mercy, and all of those things are attributes of God that we worship him for, and we are to emulate those things in our true worship with God. But we will see that in, um, I think it might be Tuesday's lesson. So we talk about the attributes of God as we worship. Some of other points, uh, I, I'm staying here on Sabbath afternoon because there are so many good points that, give, that gives us a summary of, uh, of what it means to about, uh, giving worship that never ends. And we, talk, and we see the goal of the worshiper to bow, to prostrate before him, like the Psalms explain to us, and to talk about his qualities, his goodness, his kindness, his mercy. Uh, and, and being the, the, being the powerful, holy creator. And uh, another point that is brought about, it talks about it more in the, in the later lessons we will see, but it also to bear witness about God. So we see the goal of the worship as we do that individually and in congregation, we are um, presenting our witness. And then in doing that, we have to encourage one another. And it's about, the lesson emphasizes to bear witness about God to the other nations to, and for other people to join the worship, uh, to join you and I as worshiper in the worship of the living God. So we see that there's 
a greater purpose in the worship. Of course, it is good for us, but we are also seeing that we are to, as part of our worship, we also tell others about his goodness. And we tell whether we're at work, in the office, and whether we, uh, we meet other people, you know, the idea of who God is should always come to mind. Not in a way to preach, but to talk about his goodness for us and what God means to us. All of that we see is part of the worship as we, as we witness and tell others, as the psalm says, um, to tell the other nations and to tell it in the great assembly. We see that in Psalm 22, verse, 20, uh, verse 22, it says, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. So basically, it's about, you know, we, we see that it's about telling the goodness of God, not only in the great assembly when we meet together in the congregation, but also as we meet others uh, out there in the world. All right, and uh, Psalm 55, verse 17, it says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. So the lesson brings out, I would say, two elements of worship or two parts to worship that, that, uh, that we need to talk about. We're talking about the lesson board at the individual worship and also the community worship and communal worship that we have together here. All right? And uh, first of all, we can see wherever the worship is happening, the focus is God. Uh, whether it's the individual worship that we have on our own or the congregational worship. And the individual worship can be, can be happening anywhere. It can be while you are on your bed by yourself or with your spouse or with, you know, whatever is going on in your life, you know, wherever you may be, whatever the circumstance. And what we're talking about, whether you're in a hospital, you can be you know, in a confinement or wherever it may be, that individual worship is between you and God. And, um, and also while you're cooking in the kitchen, at dinner, while you're driving, or even if you are in a deserted island like uh, John, the Apostle John, or even like Jonas in the belly of the fish, we can have that person. We know that those two individuals pray to God even in the most... Um, difficult circumstances. But we see also that God likes it when we come in congregation and when we come together to encourage one another to not only with singing and praying, but also by the way that we live with one another. You know? And the way we act with one another is all part of the worship. You know? Do we communicate out of love and kindness a spirit of unity with one another? How is it that we try to, you know, to, to, to have that daily encounter with one another when we come together? You know, and we already, um, as we have been studying in the psalm, when we come into the temple, we are really supposed to come with a spirit of joy and praise uh, for what God has done for us. And that stems from the fact that we've been having the individual worship, which help us so that when we come here, we're worthy to give more praise to God and to uh, witness to one, with one another and to be ready to give, to pour out our, our joy. Not so much to, you know, of course it's good to receive, we're going to see, but we come in the spirit that as we bless God and we know he's going to bless us in return. Uh, communal worship is done in the sanctuary with others, with believe, other believers and also with future believers, people who he may not be so sure about where they stand yet. And we can be that witness by the way that we live with one another, by the worship that we give God, not only with singing, as we mentioned earlier, with the prayer, but also with, our, uh, with the way that we live, with our lifestyle and, and our love for one another. It says here, although the praising the Lord in the congregation is identified as ideal worship, 
However, the individual worship is just as important. Sometimes people think that communal worship is where we come to have a good experience, to have a good sensation. Uh, I've heard this many times that people say, oh, I cannot attend this church because I don't really feel the worship. You know, because then automatically what comes to mind, is it really about me, you know, or is it about, you know, us pouring out to God and helping one another to pour out more of our love for God? You know, it's not so much, you know, having a feeling to say that, okay, it's got to make me feel good, but what was the connection with the living God? Okay, and the true worshiper is where we come to give God the praise. It's not about so much about, you know, my feeling, because the feelings can change, you know, and the feeling can be, uh, can, can, may not always be uh, true, but we know that uh, the idea is to focus and to pour out to God, you know, the praise that, uh, for what he's done for us. And then we have the other um, part of it. Another group of people sometimes, you know, will say, I don't need to go to church. I can just worship at home by myself. Is, is that uh, good or is that? What do you guys think? Just so I'm not doing all the talking. We can help encourage one another. What do, you, what do we think about that? Oh, we have a question in the, someone in the back has a point. So thinking about the, the difference between individual worship and communal and congregation worship. Yes, sister. But you said something about worshiping alone. The Bible says we mustn't forsake the fellowship of the brethren. Why? It helps us to grow. So we can pass on knowledge to others, and others can pass on knowledge to us. And it helps our character to be refined for God's kingdom. So that's why it is very important that we assemble together to worship. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. So we see that basically, based on that, we would say both are important. The individual worship and also the congregation uh, communal worship. And the point as... Uh, Sister Donald says, you know, to help encourage one another. The psalmist encourages worship in the congregation. Individual worship helps to feed the communal congregation worship with renewed praise. It helps to feed you so that you can, it to elevate you, to help um, build you up so that the weak worship can be even stronger. As we worship together, we should, uh, it should help to renew us so that we can go on as we leave this building, we can go home and continue to worship throughout the week. So it's a combination of the two, you know, to make our worship life more fulfilled and more complete. And uh, it, it helps to lead with uh, renewed praise and in, return the and in return, the individual worship develops its full potential as we develop a close relationship with the community of worshipers. So we become stronger individually and also we help build and, you know, so it's, uh, it goes hand in hand and they both help and influence one another, you know. And, and it, it says the individual helps build a renew and renew the community of worshipers and the congregation helps the individual to build its full potential in worship. So we see how one helps the other. Based on this, we can say the individual and communal congregation worship are essential because they help us in our worship experience. It help us to go, the, to go closer to God individually and to be able to tell others, other nations and other people about what, who God is and, 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 and to help it, each other to go closer to God. And obedience and encouragement and uplifting God and, we uplift, and also uplifting one another. And uh, I was listening to this Sabbath school online, and it says, uh, a real congregational worship of God happens when each worshiper has a real personal individual relationship with God on a day-to-day -day basis and bring it together to the congregation and with each other. If that is not done, then 
it becomes, it becomes more like a facade. It, it doesn't have the life that it's supposed to have. It is about the real worshiper coming together as we have that individual worship daily on an ongoing basis. Then as we come together, it becomes stronger. So the bottom of uh, the lesson on Sabbath, I'll finish here with that, maybe uh, we can bring some point. It says, by contrast, Individual worship of God feeds the communal worship with renewed praise, while in turn individual worship develops its full potential. The worshiping community also is called the assembly of the upright. The upright know God and are known by God, and this experience permeates every aspect of their existence. So the psalmist encourages us to have that individual worship wherever we may be, whether we are and uh, there are Wherever we are, it says uh, in the assembly or individually. So the question is asked uh, as we think about uh, Sundays is who are the worshipers? How and where do we worship? So to help us with that, we, we have the reference of Psalm 134, verse 1, 2, 3. If someone finds it, maybe they can come in with him. Just read it for us. Psalm 134, verse 1, 2, 3. Who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Flo. So... Who are the worshipers? We. Mm -hmm. How does the psalm describe the worshipers? It says, all you servants of the Lord. So you and I who have made the conscious decision to serve the Lord, whether in the sanctuary or, but the emphasis here is in the sanctuary, but those who make it a profession of our faith to you know, to serve God with all that we are and all capacities that we are able to, we are worshipers. He says, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Those who stand in the house of God, who comes in the name of the living God, who have decided to serve are the worshipers. So there's a serving aspect of uh, the worshipers. And it says, uh, and the how is, it says by lifting up of your hands. What does it mean and why, do, why is it important? What does it mean to lift up the hands in the house of God? It's, uh, as I have uh, read this, the purpose of the lifting of the hands is a sign of surrender. It can be seen in so many different ways, but one of the ways you lift up your hands before God and giving him everything, saying that, God, I surrender everything into your hand. It is not whatever it is that I'm going through, whatever it is that I'm expressing, whether it's of thanksgiving and praise, and I'm giving it all up to you. And it is something that I can say that we as a congregation don't practice that much. Do we want to reflect on that as to why we may not lift up our hands and surrender? And is that important to even do? Because some people may say, oh, the Adventists, they just sit and they never lift up their hands. They don't shout praise. Maybe they don't feel anything. Are there days that we feel like, God, I give you praise and thanks to the living God? Is that something that we should or shouldn't do? <laughs> but it is here. I know there are times that, you know, we come to church and we lift our hands up in praise. Maybe it's when we're feeling, feeling the, you know, the, the song and maybe a certain song is singing. But there are times also when not only do we do this, lifting up our hands in praise to God, but also this as leaving yourself open to receive God's blessing. And so I see that um, there are times that we do both, you know, having our hands up both ways, is that we're opening up ourselves to God and saying, here I am, Lord, take me as I am, and we're opening up our arms also to receive a blessing. Amen. Yeah. 
Anyone else has any? Thank you, Sister Williams. Now, I wonder at times if Satan doesn't trick us into worshiping him. Like, we'll go to a concert. It's not about God. It's just, you know, a regular concert. And you'll see all the hands open wide. And, you know, it's like they're lifting themselves to the music, the band, whatever it is. Just a thought. Yes, is it taught on maybe one more thought? Why we may not be lifting up more and, and knowing that what it says here, surrender. And it can be done as a sign of our worship and thanksgiving, giving God's praise, thanking him for our brother Emmanuel. We had a great week. Thank you, God, the deliverance that he has brought in our lives. I think... Sometimes Satan play with the church. Some, sometimes we don't even know that. Every time the Bible says something, the fact that the world uses it another way, we say, oh, there's no way to do it because they do it out there. But if the Bible says it, I do it. I don't care what the world do. Probably they worship something else. But I know I'm worshiping my living God. There is, should be no problem to do it, even the world do it too. So not only to raise our hand, there's a lot of things the Bible say because the world, the Satan make the world do it another way, you know. We say, oh, we don't want to look like the world. I'm not going to do it. Remember, if it's in the Bible, it's the will of God. Yes, um, I think it's in the regular uh, Sabbath school lesson where it mentioned about uh, there should be a balance between praising him like lifting our hands and also being uh, with reverence. Because sometimes uh, maybe you have observed it in some churches that uh, they will encourage you, okay, stand, stand. We have to praise God. And uh, how do you feel? Is it you being like lifted up or you're lifting God's name? Because others will end in like dancing. But uh, our lesson emphasizes uh, that the balance also of reverence and in our, the way we express our uh, praises. Because worship is really the response of us as creature to the things that our creator has done for us. We may express it in one way or another, but as long as our focus is for God, Amen. then that will be acceptable in his sight. Okay, thank you very much, Calvin. Great point. All right, so we see that uh, Continue with the lesson. The worshipers are the servants of the Lord in who serves in the sanctuary and, uh, and who blesses the name of God, who blesses God, who uplift, who lift God up in Christ and what they have done. And then we turn as we give that praise and, and lift God up and bless his name. And we see in the, in the psalm that it says that the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. So as we bless God, we have that reciprocal effect as we lift up his name, as we praise and, and thanksgiving and joy and, and worship. In return, God promises in his word that there will be blessing. So there's blessings in the worship. And uh, another point about who the worshipers are, and apart from that, it says here, as Christ is the living stone, we as servants and followers of Christ are chosen as living stones to build up the spiritual house, the a holy priesthood. And uh, we have a reference in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, it says, Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, 
you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what we see here, in other words, the lesson says, as in, in the New Testament expression of the same ideas presented in the Psalms, that as God's people, God's people are now a holy priesthood. The servant, the worshipers of God, you know, are the servants of God, but also the, the living stones. We are the church. The living stones that comprises the church are the individual worshipers, meaning each one of us here. And also the, 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 the holy priesthood uh, who is here to offer praise and thanksgiving to the Lord as their creator and redeemer for all the things that he has done for us. The worshipers represents Christ, the living stone, and we have a, a responsibility to intercede for others as Christ does and to tell others about Christ, just as we mentioned earlier about telling others in the assembly uh, to other people in other nations, wherever we are, to witness for Christ. And we see the worshiper has that responsibility to intercede and to also be, you know, one to go before Christ on behalf of uh, others. And uh, the bottom of that page it says, as New Testament believers, we have a priestly role in that we are to meditate, to mediate the good news, to mediate the good news of the gospel to the world. And uh, it asks the question, what is the most effective way that we can do this? Yes? Yeah. I thought I heard someone say that. Like this. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, the question is asked, what is the most effective way that we can mediate the good news of the gospel to the world as we talk about worship? The believers and unbelievers, they're watching you. Even if they say they're an atheist, they don't believe in God. But as soon as you exhibit non-godly attributes, they're ready to point the um, finger. See, where's the God that you believe in? Yes. Uh, again, we go, I mean, the most effective way is the daily witness that we have, and especially as we praise and uplift God and, and words and action of thanksgiving, and whether to other believers or non-believers, where we may find ourselves most of the time because we are at work, you know, when something is going on, when there's good news in our lives, when situations are happening, how do we deal with those situations? Do we bring God into the, the mix of it, whatever we may be going through at work? Is, uh, do, are we ready to talk about God's goodness and his mercy and grace? And this is, this is why uh, the question is asked, and he's talking about how we tell um, about Christ and who he is to us. And uh, the question... The answer, part of it, is says, uh, tell of your love for him and how he, has, he guides you at times of need. Tell of God's stand, uh, and, and God's standing in regard to sin and transgression, like not mixing up with the, with the life of sin and not taking pleasure in those things. You know, I know it can be so easy, you know, to call it by its name nowadays, but you can make a decision to have no part of it by the way that we live our lives and also talking about God's goodness and giving God thanks for the things that goes well in our lives and standing up for what is right and justice and fairness, those type of things that are, you know, are ways that we can um, mediate uh, the gospel and we can exchange and tell others of the good news of the gospel to the world and others around us. Uh, any other point here from you know, Sundays about how we worship and, and where being in the sanctuary and individually. And because we're going to move on to another segment of the lesson on Mondays. It talks about singing a new song to the Lord. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. What does that mean to sing a new song to the Lord, to God? What does that mean? Is it, does it mean that we... In order to worship God, we have to write a new song each and every time. How do we, how do we perceive that? 
It definitely is one of the method of worship, you know, and, but what's the reason for it? One thing that I, one way that I can definitely think of that is sometimes going to the hymnal and finding out a new song to sing to God instead of the same, same you know, songs that we, we are familiar with. You know, we can get to know a song. That's, that's one aspect of it. Any other aspect that you can think of when we think about singing a new song to the Lord? Yes, uh, Elder Bongo. Sing a new song to the Lord. Okay, singing a new song is, yes, singing praises to God, but also it's just telling what has God done for you lately? What is he doing in your life right now? And telling others about how God is working in your life. That's a new song. You can tell about the test, you know, give your testimony about what he did for you 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But you also give a new song. What is he doing for you right now? What has he done for you this week? Yes, uh, you've expressed it uh, well. It's about how God is working in your life at the particular time, in particular circumstance or situation. And uh, whether in praise and thanksgiving, even sadness and distress that we may be going through at times, you know, and where the Psalms can help to direct us, can help to guide us as we go through those situations. Because there are situations that we may be going through that it's difficult to even pray or talk to God. And worship is, you know, is really a challenge at times when, when you may be going through some things. You feel weak and you uh, can lose hope. But the, the Psalms help us, help to guide us in that, can remind us to put our trust and our hope in God. You know, where you can be honest and direct with God, because some of the psalmists have done that. And we can see, in, like Psalms uh, 43, verse 5, which says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. These are the, these are, this is an example of some of the you know, expressions from the psalmist that can speak our heart at times, especially in times of distress, where we kind of sad and depressed and downcast. And it says, why are you so downcast? Another one, another example is uh, Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. So we can use those psalms to help us in those situations. This is, we're talking about singing that new song, and the psalms helps to guide us in those uh, situations. And whether it can be a moment of thanksgiving or the moment of sadness or even moment of distress or, or feeling overwhelmed or disappointed with how the, the wicked seems to be having a good time in living the life and the upright, you know, seems to be living otherwise. And, and we can see that our hope still is in God and that we, our expectations in everything and our trust is in the living God. And, um, of course, who we'll sang a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. How do we win our victory? Who, help us to, to del who helps to deliver us from uh, the difficult situation that we may find ourselves in? But, you know, it is God, and we give him the glory. We give him the praise because it is him that gives us the victory. All right? So, so much to think about. The new song is a special song, especially rekindled joy and promising renewed devotion to God. The common themes in the psalm that tell of a, in the, of a new song are trust in God, praise of his wonderful works, and deliverance from affliction, among other things. So we, we're going to go into, some, uh, into Tuesday's lesson. Uh, it says, uh, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who are they? that worship 
the Lord again. We're talking about uh, who, who are the worshipers that may come to worship the Lord. We see here it is not so much about rituals, but about walking uprightly as we study this, uh, this day's lesson. Psalm 15 is going to help us. We can read Psalm 15 together here because it really expresses that. Is there anyone who has it? Maybe can read it for us. Psalm 15. Lord, who made my tabernacle? Who made Thank you, Sister Flo. Now, um, this psalm speaks to what you had mentioned earlier about how we live our life, because it is expressing the heart of the true worshiper. It's not, we can see here that it's not simply about coming into the congregation and giving praise and singing, singing and going back home. It's about a lifestyle. More than just, it's a, not, only just a, not only a lifestyle, but an upright life, a life of righteousness. And uh, it says here, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness. And what does it mean to walk uprightly? So we can see here that it's someone uh, who walks according to the words of God. Who, works, who is living a life of obedience, obeisance to God, you know, who is, um, and, and the psalm also <clears throat> breaks it down because it talks about someone of integrity, someone who's, who speaks uprightly, now who speaks the truth in his heart, you know, so those break down that upright person who lives, who is the true worshiper of God who change, who, who is willing to have that changed heart, a heart of repentance, who works with God in obedience. And like we mentioned earlier in the last day's lesson, in, in uh, Tuesday's lesson, or Monday's lesson, talking about being the living stone. Just as Christ is the living stone, we as the worshiper become the living stone along with Christ. We become Christ's own. And, and we express that in the way that we live because we are the church who live that upright life, and also uh, a life of righteousness, doing, doing right toward others. And he says, speaks the truth in his heart. Who does not backbite with his tongue? Who does not talk bad about others? And always, you know, gossiping and slandering and stuff like that. You know, that, that is not the lifestyle of the worshiper. You know, we, instead, the worshiper helps build one another and encourages one another, you know? And if I'm doing something that you know is not according to what God says, you, that you speak to me and, and help to encourage me to do, do differently, instead of telling, you know, several others about, you know, how Brother J be doing this and that and stuff like that. So it's not about, it's, this is the heart of the worshiper, to uplift and to build, to encourage one another. And, and not do evil to his neighbor, always seeking to do good. You know, it speaks that, you mentioned that earlier, Sister Flo, as we talk about the, the, the upright life, you know, how we live our life, you know, should reflect the life of the true worshiper of God. So that's why we, we the lesson emphasized not just coming to the congregation, but also as we live here, we live the house of God to the mission field. How is it that we are living that life? What type of life are we living? You know, are we, lift, are we lifting up one another? Are we ready to praise and give thanksgiving at, at, at work when, uh, when God blesses us? Not talking evil about others, but lifting them up. And does not take a reproach against his friend. 
and um, does not like those who are doing evil and injustice to others, but instead uh, honors those who fear the Lord. You know, what type of people that we are attracted to? Are, this, are, those, are they the type of people who honors God, who uplift God, who wants to do upright, who wants to do good? This is all that the psalm is talking about as we think about the, the worshiper. And he who, puts, who doesn't use his money or does not take money to slander another or to bring another down, to take advantage of the, the poor or the disadvantaged, you know, those are all part of who the worshiper is, who wants to do what is right, what is good, what is just, and lives that life in the church and outside. And uh, Hello. so we see here that it's not so much about the rituals, even though God does command his people to bring the sacrifices, to, you know, to do the sacrifices, but yet God is more pleased with the upright heart, with the righteous heart that we have, you know, that we, as we strive to worship and to praise him, you know, so that uh, the life that we live become pleasing to God. It is, uh, that is more the worship that God uh, is looking for. That's the type of worshiper that he, that he take pleasure in. So the true worshiper, I will end with uh, this as we come to an end. Psalm 96, verse 1 and 2, it says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. And uh, verse 3 and 4 says, Declare his glory among the nation, his wonders among the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised and to be feared above all gods. So we as worshipers, we have a responsibility you know, to worship individually on a daily basis, but also as a congregation, and also to uplift the name of God wherever we find ourselves in. And I hope that um, this lesson will help us, you know, as we grow closer and closer to God to live that spiritual life as a worshiper, as a royal priesthood, as servants, as true servants of the living God. That is the end of the Sabbath school. Thank you for your participation. Let us say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we Thank you for the lessons of today. We are asking God, please, in your mercy and your grace, that you grant your Holy Spirit to each and every believers that are here, each one of us as servants of the living God. We ask for your Holy Spirit to help us, God, as we strive to become true worshipers of the living God. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to worship you in obeisance, in uprightness, and in righteousness. And also help us to uplift Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, wherever we may find ourselves in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Elder D, for the Sabbath school lesson. I know when we come to church, do you feel different when you come to church versus when you stay at home and maybe read or just watch TV online? Do you feel a difference? I know I do. There are times when, you know, you stay home, you're thinking, okay, I'm still worshiping God, you know, I can stay home and I'll just watch a service or maybe just go from church to church, maybe in a different country. Maybe your church from your, you know, the country that, you, that you're here from, and you'll watch their service. But it's such a difference when you come in and you can see your brothers and your sisters, you can shake hands, you can hug, and know that we're all here, like-minded, just here to worship God. Because he so richly deserves to be worshipped. He's our creator, our redeemer, our friend. He's everything to us. And so we come here to worship him. Worship affords one to be in God's presence. Yes, we can be in God's presence when we're alone, when we go about our day to day. Components of worship such as offerings, praises, Bible studies, and prayer, they're important and can lead to receiving blessings. But these become hypocrisy when we are not anchored on God. When they become rituals, when our hearts our hearts has to be connected to God when we worship him. 
When we worship God, it comprises of continual praise for God in the sanctuary through songs for his wonderful deeds. Worship is sharing the word of God, prayers of confession, and deliverance, as well as our offerings. It unites God's creation to him by us going out evangelizing and just telling others how great God is, what he's doing for us in our lives. Amen? Amen. And so we do this by just letting others know that God, he's a good God. God is love. He loves them, and he's coming again soon. We will now have our mission spotlight by uh, Sabbath school offering. I'm so offering. <laughs> our Sabbath school offering is first. I'm so sorry. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for bringing us here to worship and gather and praise your name in person. Uh, we ask, Lord, that the funds that will be collected will be used to further your work, to, to reach those who need to be reached, and to bring others to your fold. Please be with us now and those who are on their way. In your name we pray. Amen. We will now have our mission spotlight by Sister Aleka Lazaga. Good morning and happy Sabbath again. Uh, the lesson, oh man, the mission spotlight for this Sabbath is titled "God uh, Glad to Be Alive," and this focuses on a man in India named Shiva. Now, Shiva is. Uh, hmm, over there, they have many gods in India, so Shiva prayed to many traditional gods and goddesses, and for him, there was no other way of life. When his adult daughter, Arti, decided to believe in another god called Jesus, he became worried. He became upset and suspicious, but when he saw that Arti's life began to change for the better, he decided he wasn't going to be worried anymore. She had many positive changes in her life. But still, despite seeing the changes in Arti's life, he still prayed 
Shiva still prayed to his traditional gods. He didn't see any need to bring in a new god into his life, is what it says. Then one day, Shiva took a bad fall at home. Um, his daughter rushed him to the hospital, and he stayed there for a few days before he was discharged. It took him about, I think it says here, a few days. Oh, it's the other one. Then he prayed. He prayed to his gods that he would get better. But while he was at home, he overheard his daughter talking to her friends and asking for prayers and praying about Shiva and, and his health. After three months, he finally recovered, and then he took another bad fall, uh, which he was then hospitalized for 15 days, and he suffered a hairline rib fracture, which uh, the physician recommended complete bed rest. When he returned home, his health, instead of taking a turn for the better, began to get worse. His daughter, Artie, was very worried, and she took him instead to an SDA lifestyle center. Under the care of an Adventist physician, Shiva slowly began to regain his health, and while he was there, a young man named Mark began to care for Shiva. Shiva was especially appreciative of Mark because Mark was very kind and very caring. And through Mark, Shiva gained a sense of Jesus' love for the first time. He saw Jesus through Mark's kindness. During his time in the Lifestyle Center, which was about four months, Shiva then went to church every Sabbath, and he learned about Jesus, he learned about the Sabbath, and he learned about the importance of good nutrition. One day, a visiting preacher gave a sermon that touched Shiva's heart, and he felt a strong desire to give his life to Jesus. But then, family issues diverted Shiva's attention, and he forgot about his desire to live for Jesus. His health then again began to deteriorate. With the help of the same physician and of Mark, Shiva began to get his strength back. And it says here, it was then that Shiva noticed a pattern. Every time he went away from Jesus, he began to have health issues. And every time he went his own way, he either fell or he faced other struggles. He sensed that Jesus didn't want him to go his own way. It was then that Shiva decided to give his heart to Jesus. He called his daughter, before I die tomorrow, and I don't think he literally meant he's dying tomorrow, it's just the chances of dying. Um, before I die tomorrow, it will be better for me to accept Jesus as my personal savior. Exactly 10 months after Shiva took his first bad fall, he finally gave his heart to Jesus. His old life was washed away in the waters of repentance, and at the age of 78, he emerged from the waters of an Indian river as a new child of Christ. Today, Shiva no longer prays to those gods and goddesses, and he only prays to one God, the God of heaven. Jesus, he says here, Jesus has helped me to stop smoking and drinking black tea. I am better and feeling healthy and pray three times a day. He thanks Jesus for keeping him alive today. I'm grateful to Jesus that my daughter took me to that lifestyle center. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known Jesus and gotten a chance to accept him as my personal savior. Thank you for your Sabbath school offering, which will specifically go to projects in India and Nepal. We'll have our ministry in music by Sister Madeline St. John. Happy Sabbath, Church. Thank 
God honors with his presence the assemblies of his people. He has promised that when we come together to seek him, to acknowledge our sins and to pray for one another, he will meet with us by his spirit. But when we gather to worship him, we should put away every evil thing. Unless we worship him in spirit and truth and in the beauty of holiness or coming together will be of no avail and that's from Prophets and Kings. Friends, as we start a new week, let us sing a new song by telling others of God's grace, God's mercy, and his wondrous, unfailing love. And in all things, let us give God thanks. I would just like to say thank you for attending Sabbath school this morning. I pray that you were truly blessed. Also, thank you for all those that participated in Sabbath school, or um, songsters, Sister Tiana for the scripture reading, Brother Emmanuel for our prayer, Sister Aleka for the mission spotlight, and also Sister Madeline for ministry in music, and uh, Brother Noah for um, playing for us this morning. Let us stand as we close out our Sabbath school. Stand for prayer. Eternal Father, God in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for sparing our lives through this week. There are so many, Father God, that are mourning the loss of loved ones and friends. Lord, we thank you for life. We thank you for the opportunity, dear God, that we can come into your house and worship you with our songs, give you praises, 
and receive a blessing from you. We bless your name, almighty God, because you are worthy to be praised. We thank you for your love. Thank you for giving us the gift of grace. Thank you for your mercy, almighty God. And Lord, as we continue on this Sabbath day, worshiping you, I pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to abide with us, abide in us, abide in our hearts. Be with those that are on their way, Father God. I pray that they will get here safely. Thank you again for all that you've done for us, and we ask all of this, dear God, in your Holy Son's name, amen and amen. Please be seated. We'll now have a ministry moment by Elder Nathan Mungin. Good morning, how you doing? All right, good to see everybody, especially with the weather happening out there the way it is. And speaking of the weather, we were originally supposed to have a fire drill this morning, but that's going to be, of course, postponed. We postponed it yesterday because we saw what kind of weather was coming in. So that's going to be postponed to probably a couple of weeks from now. So we'll let you know exactly uh, what's going on with that when we, when, we, when we find a date. But pretty much, just to explain, you know, once the fire alarm goes off, we go out these doors and we all meet on that side on the other side of the parking lot right there until everything is cleared out and then everybody comes back in. We have to do that be at least twice a year um, to make sure we're, we know what we're doing. And, um, and, and it also uh, uh, gives us a good discount on our insurance, all right? So I'll let you know the date that it's gonna happen and then uh, get with Brother Prince. I called your name. <laughs> and uh, uh, let you know what's going on, okay. Also, to, to reiterate what the pastor was talking about last week during his sermon, we now have a, a brand new translation system or unit, whatever you want to call it, all right? And it works wonderful. Um, and what you do is, if you come into the lobby, there's a QR code, you just put your phone up to there, and then it'll pop up on your phone, and you just put the language, and that's it. And make sure you have headsets. But it also, you can also read it as well. As I'm talking, it's coming out on your phone, all right? So now you can let people know. And we, right now, we can do up to 50 people. So, you know, let people know, you know, if they're having problems, understanding, because some of them was here, and they want to attend here, but they just couldn't understand. You know, now we have the capability. Um, just make sure that they bring headsets. Now, again, you can read it, but if you want to hear it, bring your, your headsets, and you'll be able to hear it in your own language. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing. And I know somebody listening to me in another language right now. Can you hear me? You, you understand? See, she understands what I'm saying. See what I'm saying? So that's great. So, you know, now, originally we had, and I'm not gonna get into it because it's Sabbath, but originally we had one hour per Sabbath. But we can't do that. I mean, people are coming in earlier. We were just going to do it. So uh, we called the guy this week and made a great deal with him for an additional 30% off. We can have four hours. So we can go from 9.30 to 1.30, the whole service. And so, but it's, it costs a little bit of money. So I'm going to ask you, as a favor, if you can give a dollar a week. Is that okay? Just one dollar a week, just put in the envelope and put translation. Because, you know, it's... it's Cost thousands, you know, but I think it's an investment, it's a benefit to our church, and we need it, all right? And again, last week people used it, they said it worked great, uh, it's starting to be used this week, so, you know, invite your friends who, and, and especially next week being International Sabbath, if they don't speak, you know, too much English, they can use the system, okay? Again, bring your headsets. Um, I know like uh, Donette and myself, she, actually she did it already. She donated, she brought some headsets this week and donated to the church. So, you know, if you want to do that, do that. But we're just asking for a dollar a week, okay? Just to, and put in the tithe envelope, just put translation on it and you'll be blessed in heaven, okay? Don't expect nothing here on earth, but in heaven you'll be blessed, all right? So I appreciate it, uh, thank you. And we'll now continue with uh, the announcements.
Good morning and have happy Sabbath to everyone. So good to see you all today. I hope you had a good week. So I have a few announcements today and um, we can follow with me in your bulletin. We have the announcement page. And um, just to inform you that last week, um, flyers were distributed in the community during the Lay Bible Ministries outreach and also during the health screenings. We um, would like to continue to distribute the flyers to promote the upcoming International Sabbath, um, which will be on the 6th and uh, the 6th and 7th International Weekend. So if you'd like to be a part of this, you know, program going out to distribute flyers, if you could join us after uh, Sabbath program today during a fellowship meal, for those who are interested in joining the team, please join us immediately after church service. So in the small fellowship, the large fellowship hall, if you're interested in being a part of this team to go out and distribute flyers. Okay, so um, these are some upcoming events we have, so we'd like to promote this. And uh, as we mentioned just now, the International Sabbath and Food Festival will be on April 6th and 7th. So on April 6th, Please represent your country of origin by wearing your country's attire and join us the next day, which was on the 7th, April 7th, for the food festival. It will be a day of fun. We do this, try to do this every year. And last year we had a lot of fun. So those are the April 6th and 7th. So it will be a fun day. And there will be cuisine from countries from around the world. So please come, bring a friend with you, bring your families to join us in that celebration. That's on April 6th and 7th, so it's in your bulletin. We are also excited to announce that Jeff Hunt will be joining us here at the Pomp and Beach Church to share his music during divine worship, as well as during a concert on April 13th. The concert will be at 6.30 p.m. on April 13th. So Jeff Hunt is a former member of the Heritage Singers, also three ABN vocalists, he was also the recipient of the International Angel Award and nominee for male vocalist. So that's on April 13, he will be here. We are also in the process of forming our disaster response team for the Pompano Beach area. And if you're interested in joining, please see Pastor Steve or Sister Viviana. Everyone knows Sister Viviana? And um, you can see either of them you know, regarding this. Uh, let us pray for Sister Margaret Dezeel and the people of Haiti. Sister Mag Margaret Dezeel is one of her members and her family in Haiti. They are currently at risk and in danger. So we're asking you, um, friends, church, family, pray for them urgently and pray for the country of Haiti. They're going through a difficult time right now. So please keep them in your prayers, okay? And pray that Sister Margaret's family will be safe. Pathfinders and Adventures, the Red Zone is coming up, Camp Calacro, May 24 through 26. And also Adventure Club meeting it will be today following the church service. Pathfinder parents, please note there will be a meeting at 1 p.m. after service today, and this will be in the small fellowship hall. That's the Pathfinder parents, please attend this very important meeting. AY will be at 6.30 today, not at 5, your bulletin says 5, but remember the time change. So AY will be at 6.30 p.m. today. And Youth Bible Study continues every Friday evening at 7 p.m. And prayer meeting is also on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And these are the announcements we have to, for today. Oh, before I, for, I forgot one important thing, how could I do that? Please forgive me. I had it stuck in my mind. We have some visitors among us, and we always welcome our visitors before I do the announcement. Pardon me for, for, for passing this over. So I'll call your names, and if you'd like to raise your hand so we can see who you are and our members and visitors near to you, just welcome them. Jean, Ricard, Jean, just raise your hand. You may be shy. Just raise your hand so we can see who you are. No? Jean, we also have Gerland. Gerland and Jose. Jose Marin, nobody wants to put your hands up. You're shy. That's okay. We'd like to welcome you to our church here, and we're glad you're here with us today and pray that you'll come back and worship with us. May God bless each and every one of us. And look in your flyers. We have the information 
um, about on the International Food Festival, please bear the dates in mind, okay? And some information on Southern for parents whose kids may be going for college. So I'm sorry. Read your bulletin. Happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Let us all take out our hymnals and begin our song service. Our first song is number 647. Number 647, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory. is number 462, Blessed Assurance, number 462.
last song is number 476, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary, number 476. stand as we sing Holy Ground. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning giving you praise and honor and glory. We come, dear Lord, to worship before your throne of holiness. We come to pay obeisance to you, dear Son, who you've sent to die 
for our sins. And Lord, we've come to open our hearts and our minds to the Holy Spirit, that your word may be brought home to us today. So bless us, dear Lord. Send your Holy Spirit's presence to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let us all remain standing and take out our hymnals again as we sing our opening song, number 616, Soldiers of Christ Arise, number 616. Happy Sabbath, church. The scripture reading today is taken from Judges chapter 8, verses 28 to 32. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the day of Gideon. Then Jeroboam, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were, who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. So now Gideon, the son of Joash, died a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, in Ophrah of the Abizrites. This is a reading of God's holy word.
let us kneel. Eternal Father and God, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today, to gather together as a church, as a family, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to know that you are the one true God. There's so many things out there that can pull on our strings, Lord, to attract us, to keep us occupied. And sometimes we forget to spend time with you. We work and play and do all these things. But Lord, it's very important, and we know it's important for us to spend time with you because once we are disconnected from you, we start to lose ourselves. We start to lose our connection. And we start to forget from whence we came. We forget the miry clay which we were stuck in in our former lives. And we have to be reminded, Lord, that you brought us from a mighty long way. Thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you for the members. Thank you for the movement that you've started in this church. We've got the ministry and the health. We've got the lay Bible ministry. And our folks are actually marching out in the communities, Lord, to reach those who need to be reached. We thank you for all the gifts that you've given us, all the gifts of uh, singing, the gifts of preaching, the gifts of teaching. Your presence is felt in this place, and we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you bestowed upon this church. But, Father, we also realize that there are areas where people are doubting your existence. Lord, people, we look at things that's going on in the Middle East. But Satan is marching across the globe, Father. He's reaching our neighbors down in Haiti right now. And folks are really, really feeling it. They're going through so much difficulty, Lord. Violence is widespread. It's in our backyard. It's right here. And though the world is looking and taking a blind eye to what's going on, we, your people, see the advance of the enemy. We feel just like Jesus feels. We know what's going on. And so because of that, we can't turn a blind eye. Our hearts and minds are with those people down there. We have family members here who are connected to the folks down there. We are connected because we are one. We came from one blood, one man, one woman. And because we're all connected, we must feel their pain as well. This is a church, Father, a world church. And we're part of a major church, Lord. We don't, we're not alone. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't view ourselves as Elijah. Just, just knowing that there are millions and millions of others out there like us who are praying and hoping for your soon return. Lord, we, 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 we want you to come. How long can we stand what's going on? Crime is rampant. The, 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 the fear of the Lord is not within man. And people run to and fro doing everything that they want to do. Ah, what a world we live in. It is so humbling to know that we serve a wonderful God who sees and knows everything. And even though we are experiencing these things that we're experiencing, Lord, you are still in control of everything. Yes. And so, Father, we put our trust and faith in you that one day, one day, all of this will come to an end. But in the meantime, Lord, we have a work to do. Give us the strength and the power and the wisdom to go out each day and spread your word. Spread the gospel, knowing that we are not in this world alone. We have a mission. We are, we've been called to do a certain task. Help us, Lord, to not shirk from our responsibilities. And Lord, let me not forget to mention those who are ill, who are in pain within our, within our own ranks, Father. They're going through things personally. We pray for those. We pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those who are, uh, have one foot in and one foot out of the church, Father. We, we pray that they will come back. They will see the need to rejoin our ranks, Lord. 
that there's love here, that there's peace here. And there are folks here who are willing to uh, uh, encourage them to stay in the church and stay connected to you. And for our children that are on the roads every, each and every day going to school, Lord, we pray for them. We ask you to cover them, Lord, and continue to bless them that they may continue to grow in the knowledge of you. And Father, as we continue to worship you today, I pray that your spirit will be with us and that we will know that you, we've spent time with you when all is said and done. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. All right. I made an announcement this morning, and I'm just going to reiterate it shortly because uh, a lot of people showed up. But we talked about we have a new translation system here, and it works wonderful. There's people right now listening to me in their own language, sort of like what happened at Pentecost. Remember that? All right. God is going to finish his work. All right. There's so many things happening now, so many avenues that are open to us to spread the word that there's no excuse. All right, so he's coming soon. So we asked, and I asked this morning that uh, it, it costs a bit of money, so we're asking that, you know, if you can afford a dollar per week or five dollars a month, just put it in the tie of envelope and put translation on it, and it'll go to help us to uh, support that ministry because it's an important ministry. There's a lot of people that want to come here that I'm told every week. So, again, we thank you in advance, and, you know, it's our job any way we possibly can to get the message to everybody, all right? And this is another way God is using to further and advance his gospel. So we thank you for that, all right? In nature, some things multiply by dividing. Some cells increase by splitting. Plants multiply only when the seeds are, soon, are sown liberally. A farmer who sows sparingly reaps sparingly. It is the same in God's kingdom. We should tithe our income because we love God and acknowledge of God's ownership of all things. We are dependent upon God for all blessings, and he bestows them in numberless ways. And I'm pretty sure you can, if you go back and think, you can think about all the time that God has blessed you. All right, so this is the time that, that we give back what's God's originally, but he lent us to show our faith and trust towards him. So with that, will the deacons and deaconesses come forward with the morning's tithe and offering.
Alex. Father in heaven, first of all, we'd like to thank you again for bringing us, your people, together again on this another Sabbath day, Lord, commemorating your goodness toward us through creation and redemption. We ask, Lord, that we never forget that. We keep that in the forefront of our minds. And, Lord, we pray now that the money that has been collected, Father, may go to do your bidding, your will, Father, to finish this great work that you started with this church. Be with it, Lord. Bless it. And we uh, be with bless those who gave and also bless those who wouldn't be able to give, Father. Be with us all, we pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll now have our children's story by Brother Oswald Stubbs. And uh, for that, we invite all the young people, all the children, to uh, come up front, uh, to my left here, to listen to Brother Stubbs. Everybody happy? Say amen. amen. It's so nice to see you all today, although it's bleak outside, but it's warm inside. The story today is going to be about a little boy who went from prison to the palace. Who would think that might be? You know, yes? Joseph. Say it loud. Uh, Joseph, that's the boy. Yeah, Joseph was a peculiar young man. Uh, he grew up among many brothers who didn't like him because he was well loved by his father and was given special treatment by his father, making him special coat of many colors, and the other boys were jealous of it. However, it happened that he ended up in a prison because um, they was going to kill him, but somebody said, no, let's put him, sell him to the Midianites. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so um, he ended up in prison. And when, while he was there in the prison, he, um, the butler and uh, the baker was also in prison. And they had a dream, and they dreamt that one dream that um, saw us here and the other one dream. And he was able to interpret the dream. So they were released from prison. And he said, when you go into the um, Pharaoh, remember me. But they were so happy to come out that they didn't even remember that somebody named Joseph. Didn't remember him at all. However, um, after a long time, Pharaoh had a dream. And... Uh, he dreamed, and all the wise men in Egypt didn't, couldn't interpret the dream. And the guy said, oh, yes, there's this guy in prison named Joseph. Um, he interpreted the dream, and it came out. So I sent for him. Sent for Joseph. Joseph came up, and he interpreted the dream. As a result of that, that there be um, seven um, cows that are skinny and, you know, fat ones. He said, well, the fat cows are telling you that there will be a time of plenty. So get in all the corn you can and save it up for when the um, time of um, for famine comes around. It was done. So uh, he got a job to work in, um, in, in the governor's house. And uh, the governor's wife saw that he was a young, strong, healthy-looking man, and she wanted to get at him. And um, he says, no, 
of almost I sin against God and do this evil. So she keep pursuing him until one day he decided to run and she grabbed his shirt, ripped it off his back until a lie on him. He tried to hold him and he was sent back to prison. Now Joseph had such an integrity that he preferred to lose his shirt rather than give up his belief in God. And uh, he went back to prison. And after uh, a long time, he was released. And not only that, but he became governor over all Egypt. And he was able to save his family and his friends from starvation. Okay? Now, anybody learn anything from the story? Anybody? Sometimes we dream, we don't keep it to ourselves. It may have a little meaning, right? Anyway, um, you can get up now and go get your, collect your offering. Remember to say thank you. Okay? Okay, now it's time to pray. Uh, could you say a prayer for me? Lord, I thank you for everything that you have created us to help us survive and Lord, I thank you for keeping us safe from wars, like the Israelite-Palestinian war and the Ukrainian war between Russia. Lord, I thank you we're far away from that. But Lord, I thank you for the safety that we needed. And thank you for 
not making us have to go in wars so everything can be bombed. Lord, I thank you for life and food, strength. Lord, I thank you for um, the things, the items, the objects that you have created us for us to survive. Amen. Oh, before you go, I'd like to leave you with a little um, gem. I want you to read, to repeat after me. Labor for learning before you grow old. For learning is better than silver and gold. Silver and gold will vanish away, but a good education shall never decay. Okay, go in peace. The measure of a church is in its children. And I see a lot of young people up here this morning. And I'm looking at the young people and how, how they represent their parents. And I'm looking at Brother Stubbs and how he's representing the church with his uh, stories. And he never stops. He's got so much wisdom. Thank you, Brother Stubbs. Our, our, our sermon today is going to be brought to us by our pastor, uh, Pastor Steve Verse, for those who are here for the first time, and those online, um, he's our pastor, and um, he's a, a master mechanic. He's a he's a guy that uh, that that he's a he's a technician, and things have to be done right. You've got the angles and everything that he everything is measured out, and so God uses people. He uses those that he's given gifts, and the, the gifts that he's given this young man uh, is embodied in his work. And so today his sermon is 300 men with a question mark. 300 men? And so we're going to find out what the pastor has and what the Lord has put on his mind uh, for us today. But before he does that, we'll have a special music by Sister Aleka. Sister Samantha. Oh, we've got so much talent in this church. And Sister Samantha, thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Gift of a lifetime. 
Before the pastor comes up, if there's a Sister Patricia Hackman here, can you just meet me in the lobby right quick? Sister Patricia Hackman, uh, I'll meet you around in the lobby. You're not in trouble. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's raining outside. But there's joy in our hearts. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We get to worship the Lord in freedom today. Amen. Amen. As I've been watching the developments around the world, in the Middle East, in Haiti, in major parts of the world, we see that the end is near. And God has called his people to be the ambassadors to the lost of the world. My name is Pastor Steve Verse, and uh, I want to welcome you to the Pompano Beach Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I also want to welcome those who are watching online. 
those who are watching by Facebook, those who are watching by the live streaming, and those who will watch this week even after this service is done. We are growing, amen, amen. in our um, watching audience. And um, the beautiful thing about it is that God is glorified, amen? amen. <laughs> and so we're, we're thankful for that. Now, I do want to uh, mention something to you. We have our international festival that is coming up. And uh, please grab some flyers to give to your friends. I've been inviting people. I've been going through my neighborhood, inviting uh, my neighbors. And um, uh, we are going to uh, give a, some to our district pastors who will be meeting here this week. We're going to invite uh, them to come on Sunday and to uh, be with us. So please uh, continue to pray and to give that invitation so that everyone uh, can understand that this is an international church. So the title of the message today is 300 Men, Part 2. And those who were here last week, you uh, saw uh, and uh, we talked about a very ordinary man that God used in an extraordinary way. So before we begin this morning, let's take a moment and bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your goodness and your love. And Lord, we ask that the, your divine presence would be with us. Send your spirit, Lord. Help us to understand, even though we are small, we can be great in your eyes. And we can be used of you, no matter who we are, no matter where we've come from, that you can use us. And that what matters most is character. So bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So by way of review, those uh, who are watching uh, and those who are here that were not here last week, we want to review a little bit about what happened last week. Ezekiel 22, verse 30 says, I saw the man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the Lord, for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none, not even one. And I chose this story of Gideon because Gideon represents a time in history that is quite similar to what we're living now. Many people have forsaken the Lord and many of God's people are despondent and discouraged. And in those times of despondency and discouragement, God has a message, amen? And God wants us to understand that no matter what the circumstances are around us, God is always going to win. Amen? Amen? And so God uses simple people. And we talked about who Gideon was, and the spirit of prophecy tells us that Gideon was the son of Joash of the tribe of Manasseh. The division which this family belonged to held no leading position. See, Gideon was the least of the least. And all of his family, as you remember from last week, were killed by the Midianites. And he was the only one that was left. And God called this singular man 
who had a great heritage because he came from the line of Joseph. And Joseph had the character that God wanted to pass on. And two tribes were named the namesake of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. They were the smallest tribes, as you remember. But God used a man from the smallest tribe there in Israel, a man of no reputation. But he came from a great family. See, God has always had his men. God will raise up a standard against the evil. Thomas Edison puts it this way, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overhauls and looks like work. See, we must remember that character is built by trial. Character is built by sustaining. Longfellow puts it this way. He says, the heights of great men reached and kept were not obtained in sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, toil upward in the night. And so this character building is so important for the people of God. Vernon Howard puts it this way, we are exactly where we have chosen to be. Regardless of your circumstances or mine, we are exactly where we want to be. But you say, Pastor, how can that be? And when he found that he was in trouble, he did some things. He set out a fleece and he said, Lord, I want you to direct my life. And then there was a time of waiting and sometimes we have to wait on God for him to fulfill what is for us. And then finally, there's the surrender where we surrender to the will of God. Are you surrendering to the will of God Today, have you made the choice this morning to follow his will? Ayn Rand puts it this way. She says, the question isn't who is going to let me, it's who is going to stop me. If you want to go, you will go. And circumstances make little or no difference. One anonymous author puts it this way. He says, a successful man is one who can lay a firm foundation with the bricks others have thrown at him. Amen. So character is built through trial. Character is built through submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. God wants us to have good character. And sometimes we're discouraged by the deficiencies and the things that go wrong in our lives. One anonymous author puts it this way. He says, sometimes you face difficulties, not because you're doing something wrong, but because you're doing something right. Doing right because it's right. Right? Right? Again, this was the circumstance. Ezekiel twenty-two thirty, a despondent people. I sought a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none, not even one. See, when we find our circumstances are despondent, when we find the world around us encroaching upon us, when we find reasons to be discouraged, that's an opportunity. Amen? When things are low, God's people 
should be high. Amen? Because where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. See, in the difficulties and vicissitudes of life, God gives us an opportunity to look up to him. That daunting test that's coming, that board certification, that battle that you're facing with your own flesh. God will give the victory he's promised. God has promised that he will deliver you. God has delivered, will deliver, and does deliver still. So remember who you serve, the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, the personage that creates when he speaks. This is whom we serve. We don't serve mortal men. We serve the God of heaven who has unlimited resources that he will release for his will. Are you in his will? If we're in his will, he says that if you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you. Amen. Amen. I ask dad for all kinds of things. All the time. I'm asking him every day, Lord, please help me. Now last week I ended with a story. Now, I, I got a number of phone calls about that last story. It was about our first van. Everybody remember it? How God literally talked to me in my head and told me to get that van. Well, I went up to the door, as I stated, and this big, tall, bald man, I asked him for the mobile Mobile medical van, it was a high top. And um, he said, praise the Lord, it's yours. Now that man, his name is Joe Scrimma. And Joe Scrimma, upon meeting him, started a lifelong friendship. Joe just died just uh, about a year ago. And Joel was a conscientious, devoted Roman Catholic. And at one point, we even uh, worked in a foster care situation with his son named Mark. And we got to know the family real well, and we shared with them the, the good news of Jesus. But that man had a relationship with the Lord Jesus that I wish many others would have. Because he was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. He didn't have to think about it. He did it. Well, that mobile medical unit, we worked in Benton Harbor. And uh, we, we taught people how to read out of that thing. We did health screening. We did food distribution. We helped the homeless. We, we referred them to other services, and we, we were known as the health people in Benton Harbor, Michigan. God will do great things. Now let's go on to part two. See, God has an army. We are his army. We are his foot soldiers. We are his captains. We are his majors. We are his sergeants. And we are his privates. God wants us to know that every soldier in his army has the status of a child of God. 
God wants us to know. And as a result of Gideon's actions, it brought 40 years of peace. The Bible puts it this way. Judges 8. If you'll turn over there with me, I'd like us to get into our Bibles. Judges chapter 8, and look with me at verse 28. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel. Hallelujah. A pagan, despotic people who God had used Israel as an instrument of judgment to subdue a people who had gone beyond the bounds into judgment. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for how long? Forty years in the days of Gideon. Now, God made a difference through one man that changed the whole nation and changed the way that that nation related not only to him, but to the world. Can God change the world by one man or woman? I believe he can. History is full of people that have done this. And I've talked to people in the past, such as, such as Norm And you may remember the story of Norm. Norm started what was called the Green Revolution. And Norm developed these plants that would give triple and quadruple harvest. And at his death, he was proclaimed the man that fed a billion people. One man. And one thing I see in common with all of these men and women that I've studied, Florence Nightingale, others, they all had good character. Amen. So what happened to Gideon? Let's look at, look at verse 29. Then Jerubbabel, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring. Now remember in the Bible, a large family meant that you were successful meant that you had God's favor, for he had many wives, and God dealt with that later as well. And his concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. And later on, everyone knows what happened with Abimelech. Abimelech did not walk in the ways of Gideon. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age, hallelujah, and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, in Oprah of the Abizurites. What a heritage. An un a very common man used of God to change the world. Are you a change agent? Are you someone that God can use? Am I someone that God can use? God can do great things through humble men. But what about character? I'd like to spend some time today talking about character. I want to look at biblical character, and I want to look at character in general. Character, the word character is a noun. 
It's an aggregate of features and traits that form the individual nature of some person or thing. One such feature or trait or characteristic. Character, individuality, personality refer to the sum of characteristics possessed by a person. Character refers especially to moral qualities, ethical standards, principles, and the like. That's from dictionary.com. So character is the moral underpinnings by which we operate. We don't lie and cheat and steal if we have good character. The word character can be traced back to the Greek, kerasasin, meaning to sharpen or to cut in furrows or to engrave. This word gave the Greek character, a noun meaning mark or distinctive quality, a meaning that was shared by the Latin character. When English adopted the word in the 14th century, this, a, this is a distinctive, a differentiating mark. You must remember when they wrote back then, either in clay or on stone, they had to engrave the characters in to the substance. And so that was the character, that was the mark that was made. Have you ever heard he made his mark in life? That's character. It was among the earliest meanings of the word along with a conventionalized graphic device placed on an object as an indication of ownership origin or relationship. A, a definition that includes the letters of the alphabet which make up the word itself. So the character is the mark on the individual, is the engraving that's done in the person. See, character isn't always what you do, it's what you are. It's what you're made of. It's, it's the stuff. Do you have out of the good stored up in this heart? Character. See, a tree produces fruit. And the wonderful thing is that character knows no bounds. See, we can sit around and complain about our lot or we can do something about it. One anonymous author puts it this, thing, this way. He says, working to improve something is better than crying about how bad things are. And so we need to understand that we must have good character First Peter 2.11 says this, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. So good character means that we have the sinews, we have the muscle, we have the desire to do good. Also, the man of character or the woman of character is willing to serve. Ralph Waldo Emerson puts it this way. He says, a great man is always willing to be little. Are we willing to be little? Or do we need to have the highest spot? Proverbs 10.9 Whosoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. And so character is the sum and substance of the whole, and God wants us to know. Billy Graham puts it this way. He says, the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren 
is not money or other material things accumulated in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. Amen. What are we passing on to our children? Not just stuff. Romans 5, 3 and 4. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces So God wants us to develop character, and character is the work that's done in the shadows. Mignon McLaughlin puts it this way. She says, character is what emerges from all the little things you were too busy to do yesterday, but you did them anyway. See, character is the choice to do the right the character is the choice to do the inconvenient. Character is the choice to serve. Do you have character? Or are you a character? We must ask ourselves the question. Titus 2 verse 7 puts it this way, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity, dignity. Those great words that you hear and you read in the books should be typed on our hearts and engraved in our minds and we should be people of character and integrity. Amen? I met a man recently. His name is Daniel. And Daniel um, had a, um, a friend of his that had gotten sick. His name was Howard. And Daniel was uh, the neighbor to Howard. And he noticed that Howard was getting sick. And he would go over to Howard's house and he would help Howard. And he began to, to build a, a, a really good friendship with Howard. And as Howard got sicker and sicker, Daniel did more and more. And when I met Daniel, the first lady and I, uh, we happened to see a, a car, a car that they had for sale. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a Toyota Prius. And, and I talked to Daniel, and I said, Daniel, you know, I would like to look at the car because I'd like to get a, a, a car that the first lady likes, but yet is good on gas, so on and so forth. And uh, I said, well, what would you like me to do, give you a, a deposit or whatever? He said, oh, no, don't worry about it. Just take the car and look at it and then bring it back when you're done. And so, um, so I did that. And then I uh, came back to Daniel and I said, Daniel, I'd like to buy your car. And, uh, and I said, well, what do you want me to do? He just stuck out his hand and I shook his hand. And that was our agreement. I shook Daniel's hand. I love it when I can shake a man's hand. Well, you know what I mean, don't you? My mother always used to say, Son, your word is your bond. When I tell you I'm going to do something, I do it. And that's the way my mother was. My mother said something, she did it. And she drilled it into our kids' heads. 
If you tell somebody you're going to do something, do it. Because it tells who you are. And so, sure enough, shook the hand, went and gave Daniel the check, and then the business was done. And other people came to Daniel, and Daniel told me, he said, Pastor Verse, I want you to know that people have been coming by here, and they offered me more money than you paid. Now, if he was an unscrupulous character, he had shaken my hand. But he said, I told him, the car is sold. The car is yours. It's so refreshing to meet people like that. Amen? Amen. Character. Thomas Paine, the, the very famous revolutionary founder of our country, said this. Reputation is what men and women think of us. Character is what God and the angels know of us. Do we have character? Character counts. 1 Corinthians 15.33, the Bible says this, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. There's an old saying that goes this way, You are who you hang around with. Who do you hang around with? Are they people of character? Because you are what they are. Birds of a feather flock together. Proverbs 12:26 The righteous choose their friends carefully. But the way of the wicked leads them astray. Do you choose your friends carefully? Would you trust your friends in your garage at night? Would you trust your friends? Charles de Gaulle puts it this way. He says, the man of character finds an especial attractiveness in difficulty since it is only by coming to grips with difficulty that he can realize his potentialities. Amen? Character is built in trial. The furnace of affliction. And of course, General, General de Gaulle, everyone knows who he is, the famous French general. Acts 17, 11. Now the Bereans were more noble in character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Character. Checking up on things. Character is developed in the school of affliction. Character is developed by the trials that happen in life. But character is also developed by the successes in life. Amen? Amen? Lloyd McAlvery puts it this way. He says, the measure of a man's character is what he would do if he knew he would never be found out. See, character reaches into the inner recesses of the heart. The heart reveals the character. And the character is simply the outgiving of the heart. And the actions are reflected upon what's really in the heart. See, out of the heart are the issues of life. Do you have a good heart? Is your heart working? And I'm not talking about your physical heart. 
God wants us to know that we can have good hearts. Proverbs 10, 8, and 9 says this, The wise are glad to be instructed, but babbling fools fall flat on their faces. People with integrity walk safely, but those who follow crooked paths will slip and fall. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over again. In the end, in the end, all that we're taking to heaven is our character. What are we doing with our character? Are we growing each day? Are we taking the time to not go the easy way, but to go the right way? In business, in our relationships, in our families, in our employment, are we people of character? Can we be trusted? That is the question. And God wants us to develop good character. Because good character is what will take us on in to the kingdom. Amen. I'd like to share with you another personal story. It was two weeks ago. I left the church here uh, from um, a meeting. And uh, I was traveling down Crooks Road, not Crooks Road, uh, Copens. Opens Road. And does everyone know where the railroad tracks are? They're at Copens. I was, I was going along and we were going at normal speed and all of a sudden the traffic went to a screeching halt. I found myself in the middle of the railroad tracks. Stopped. Dead. Stopped. Now, I don't know if you ever found yourself in the middle of railroad tracks. And we just sat there. And I could not see what was happening. Unbeknownst to me, as I was going along, all of a sudden two cars collided right in the middle of the road. And it blocked the lanes. And I was getting a little nervous there. I'm like, oh, I can't move because we, we were boxed in because we all came to a sudden halt. Then all of a sudden, ding, 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 and I'm in the middle of the railroad tracks, and I prayed. I said, "Lord, help me, help me, Lord." Help me. Now, I know you've got about 30 seconds before it comes through because the arms come down. And I was praying. And I had my foot just ready <laughs> to go. I couldn't go anywhere because I was literally boxed in by the car in front of me. And I said, Lord, help me. And then off in the distance, I could see the train. And my thoughts were, oh, Lord, if this is my time, I want to be right with you. Then
then all of a sudden the, the car in front of me lurched forward. And I stepped on the gas and I was probably this far from the train when it went by. I could feel the wind from the train. My car went like this. And I was two feet from death. I don't know where the space came from. I don't know why the guardrails did not hit my car, but they did not. All I know is God saved my life. And when I got up there, finally they had dragged the two cars off to the side. And I thought to myself, I said, it's only a minute, man. See, we never know when our time is up. We have no guarantees for, of tomorrow. The choices we make today will determine our eternal destiny. So what about you today? Are you thinking about your eternal destiny? Are you contemplating the character that you're developing? I hope so. Because character is not developed in a vacuum. Character is developed by the purposeful intention of being someone better. Do you want to be someone better? I do. Did that experience change my life? Yes, it did. I've been through similar experiences, and I'll share some of them in the future. But the God of heaven wants us all to know that we are his soldiers, that we are his ambassadors, that we are his people who will make a difference in this world. See, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where we came from. It doesn't matter the disadvantages or advantages in our life. What it matters is, are we committed to the Lord Jesus Christ? And if we're committed to him, are we willing to do his will in a world that's so easy to do wrong? Will we develop character in the midst of a world that's abandoned? And will we be the voice of the God that wants to save you and me and that person who does not know him? Let us pray. Father in heaven, The only thing we're taking to heaven is our characters. And Lord, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But Lord, we want to be covered with your righteousness. We need your Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, I need you. And Lord, please help us, Lord. Help us to do the changes that we need to do. Help us to be a better mother, a better father, a better husband, a better wife. Help us to be a better worker. Help us to be a better servant. Help us to be a better Christian. Help us to represent you aright and not lie and not steal, and not abuse other people. 
and not do the things that would bring us unlawful gain. Oh God, give us a new heart. I want that new heart, Lord, and you promised it to us. You said you'll take away our heart of stone and you'll give us a heart of flesh. Lord, I want that new heart today. And Lord, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to see those who want to raise their hand and say, Lord, I want you to give me a new heart. I want you to change me from the inside out. And we will give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all take our hymnals in hand and stand as we sing our closing song, number 612, Onward Christian Soldiers, number 612. <laughs>
Um, before I close, um, for those of us who wish to um, join, join us with the um, handing out flyers, please meet us in the fellowship hall. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've heard you this morning. We've taken into consideration the things that you've told us, two feet from death, two seconds from death. As pastor was uh, preaching, we consider the mortality that we have, Lord. Each and every day you hold us in your arms. We don't know when. It is our time. But the time that we have, we have to make use of it. So, Father, we ask that as we leave here today, that we'll remember who we serve. The God that we serve can do far more abundantly, more than we can ask or think. And to you be the, all the glory, honor, and praise forever and ever. In Jesus' name.